checks bounce, that'll go through. That's when I knew that it was over, tell me what did I do? Be specific, is it that I'm not rich and ambitious, too religious? I know, I know, I showed too much interest. I almost wish that you would tell me get lost to go away. I thought you said that we were friends, let's talk, communicate. I never got a chance to say what it meant to me. Though the birthday wishes might have been judicious, I didn't even pick the phone up. Here's my rebuttal, it took us just to call, but you busted a bubble. When the smash of the bubble, I will rise up. Is it just my luck or was it ass on the truck? Just my luck or was it ass for trouble? Can't look back, live life in the past. The world can crash and collapse and around me. Gas me for breath, death, come to collect. I can't wait. The stage is set, my debt's paid, no regrets. I finished the course, kept the faith, no request. Show some respect, you know what it takes. To work up the courage to ask to go for a day, give me a break. You wasted my time, I was attracted to your kindness. Back on the grind, I'm glad it's finally behind us. Back in the mind, I'm still stuck with my luck. I find a diamond in the rough. If I keep trying, I'll finally wise up. She flaked out on dinner and saved me 25 bucks. Hello, hello. Welcome, everybody. Welcome back. It's been a few weeks, probably a month now since I've been live, but uh, I am Young Penitent and welcome to my Icon Corner. What you just heard was a rare recording, a uh, rare recording of a song that I made about five years ago now, and it was kind of hidden and I never really published it uh officially it's not really it's kind of a home recording it's not the best you know it's not the best quality of vocals or anything but uh you know i've written a handful of songs over the years and um that was one of them and you know it's something that one was about a period of my life when i was uh trying to find a wife and the song was called keep trying and the idea is you know you just keep you just don't give up you just keep going uh since then i have kind of like kind of given up on the search for a wife, but the song is still good. I have to be uh, motivated. I have to have something inspire me when I write a song. But when I started this channel, it was all about, it was about publishing my music. So I, uh, I, I would think the Orthodox world needs a rapper. And I think I am the person to do it. So give me a thumbs up right now if you think the same thing, if you agree with me. Uh, I would like to be writing some more songs in the future. I'm trying to. I'm focusing on it. And uh, so that has kind of been maybe what I've been doing in my downtime. And I also kind of needed a little break. Uh, tonight, we are going to have on, on with us, uh, we have Thaddeus Patrick. We're continuing our uh, series of interviews with prominent Orthodox profiles on X. And... Um, Oh, but first I wanted to say uh, subscribe to the channel because that is just what people do. Here we are. Uh, I am young, penitent, and penitent. A penitent is someone who is repenting, someone who is in repentance. And if you are in repentance and you are in the church, then you are struggling against your sins and you are on a good path. You are likely to be saved as long as you remain in repentance to the end of your life. I think the end of your life will be a good one. So uh, if you want to come along for the journey, if, if that's what you're interested in, subscribe to the channel and come along with us now. So tonight, uh, Thaddeus is the guest, and uh, I wanted to say a few words before I bring him on uh, about what led me to invite him on. Now, we were both, I was, we were uh, mutuals on X, and uh, I had thought about bringing him on before. But recently, there was, unfortunately, uh, a little bit of drama, and he was the center of attention on X for a few weeks. And it was mostly, 
unfortunately, it was negative attention. And to my great shame, I logged on to X and I was exposed to this, uh, this um, you know, constant barrage of the, the, uh, the algorithm picking up, uh, picking up this. Uh, basically, it was a beef, a Twitter beef, it seems like. But so to my great shame, I logged on to Twitter and I was exposed to it. Uh, but what uh, it appeared to me was Thaddeus was being canceled. And I have talked about this before, about cancel culture and Christianity. And uh, I think it was in my uh, Revenge of the Ortho Bros video. And I stated in that video that cancel culture is antithetical to Christianity. We cannot be participating in cancel culture as Christians. What is cancel culture if you don't know? Cancel culture is when you find something from someone's past, you dig up some dirt, and then you present it to, to the world and you say, because of this, we can't we can't be deal follow this person, we can't deal with this person. Uh they're a bad, they're a bad person. So uh don't, you know, they're 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 basically you try to end this person's career, basically. It's kind of like in hip hop, when you got two rappers going at each other and it's a beef. And the idea and the beef is whoever has the best rap basically ends the other person's career. And uh, I'm not trying to stir up any beef here because usually uh, in beefs, it's usually the person who has the largest audience wins hands down. So I am not attempting to do that, but I do have a word of exhortation. Uh, Orthodox Christians, this is a temptation for us on the internet. And so Orthodox Christians, be aware of this. Fight against this uh, this temptation to engage in cancel culture. This is X picking up on our weaknesses. This is the algorithm. And it's it's not healthy for us. We need to move past this. We need to, you know, make an effort collectively. And so that is uh, the word I had to say of exhortation. And with that, I'm going to bring on Thaddeus. Welcome to the channel. Thank you. I, I hope I haven't embarrassed you with my uh, opening monologue. It was perfect. Okay, was thank you. Um, so, uh, so let's see. First, we first off, we usually start our. Uh, our interviews with an introduction, and I will allow you to introduce yourself however you would like. Uh, you know, take as long as you like. Yeah, um, I'm Thaddeus, Thaddeus Patrick online. Um, I am what I call a Orthodox Christian coach slash therapist. Um, I do coaching for people who are looking for kind of the blend between psychology and orthodoxy. So they have um, hesitation going to say a secular therapist, but at the same time they need to deep dive and process um, a little more than they can do with their priest. And so a lot of people get a blessing from their priest before meeting with me. Um, a lot of other people that come to me are like spiritual seekers, people who are uh, ortho curious. And we talk about applying an orthodox mindset to psychological problems, um, things like invasive thoughts. And the church fathers have a lot to say. And then some of the things that psychology has to say are helpful too. But of course they have to go through the orthodox filter. And so that's that's kind of the main thing I do. Um, and then I'm very active on social media. And so I interact with a lot of people on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter in particular. And um, that's probably my my main haunt. Um, but yeah, that's, that's the gist of it. Okay. And uh... So you're, you, I understand you have a blessing from your priest to, to do this. Yeah. Yeah. My it's so what I do is something that I, I concede to people. If, if I encounter someone else who's like, oh yeah, I'm, I'm doing like psychology with some spiritual advice. If I hear someone else doing that, I go, Hmm, that sounds like I, I would like to know more about that. Um, so, so I think it's a valid thing that, that something that's a little, um, I hesitate to use such an extreme word as non-traditional, but um, it is, it is, I don't know many other people that are, are 
doing this outside of people who are like licensed counselors or something. Um, but how I how I started was um, my my priest before the the current priest that I'm under the care of um, encouraged me to do this. He said, okay. you know, if you just if you just make business cards of some sort, um, like I have a couple of people I would refer to you. And um, when I, I moved from Spokane, Washington to Salt Lake City, uh, my priest here, um, you know, met with me, had some conversations, knows my old priest and, and extended that blessing. Um, and so the, the strength that I bring to the table is not that I have some like unique spiritual insight or something like that. Um, I'm very good at simplifying things. I'm very good at taking something really complex and making it simple and practical for the person in front of me. And so that's, that's the main thing that I bring to the table. Um, I've had people who sometimes come to me and they're like, this is what my priest said. And sometimes I'm helping explain it to them why it's good advice for them to have received. Mm -hmm. um, so I, you'll uh, very rarely am I ever like in opposition to someone's priest. Um, and that's pretty much like out of my jurisdiction. Um, right. But a lot of times I find them saying like, yeah, he said this to me, it didn't make sense. I'm like, oh, well, well, here's this story from the saints and here's this psychology concept. And my goal is that they walk away like with that making more sense to them. Um, but yeah, my I was originally like encouraged by my priest to do what I do. Um, and I tell people run, you know, run stuff I've said by, by your priest. Um, I kind of I kind of see it as the the conversations I have with people are like a, an in depth version of the kinds of conversations you might have at coffee hour because at coffee hour you're talking to some of the the people there and like I've always I've been with those people a long time which I think was when my priest started saying like like you should do this more often with people um, mm -hmm. but there's all those those wonderful people at, at most parishes who are like sharing their experiences and their stories and the lives of saints and I particularly. Um, when I encountered Elder Thaddeus of the Tovnitsa, who's my patron, um, the Serbian elder who's soon to be canonized, um, he he changed my life. Like I had my four-year bachelor's degree in psychology and I had a Protestant Bible degree. And I was kind of, I didn't realize at the time I was looking into how do I heal myself through those things? And they they weren't enough. Like I, Protestant spirituality, you know, a lot of beautiful, pious things, but it was, I was still what I would say is spiritually malnourished. And I looked mm. to psychology, which was insightful, but it wasn't enough. And I, when I found this book, one of my first Orthodox books was Elder Thaddeus, and I'm reading it, and something in my heart was just like, this might work, and I'm going to try it. And I just like, almost like science experiment, I just tried what he said, and I noticed over the long term, it actually affected me. And it affected me so much that when I was first looking into Orthodoxy, um, my parents thought I was getting into uh, what they might call a, like they, my dad had bad experiences with Catholicism as a kid. Um, they might call what, so they didn't, they didn't have good feelings towards Catholicism. And what they might have called what I, they thought I was in was ca a Catholic cult, but worse. Like that's probably how they would have mm. seen it. Um, Cause I was very, I was very the typical convertitis arguing and overly excited about everything I was learning about church history. And by the grace of God, a year later, the just Elder Thaddeus and just, I wasn't even a catechumen yet, um, just the change they had seen in me, they did a 180 and they're like, we're, we're actually really glad you became Orthodox. We can see that, that this is Christ and, and working in you and healing you. And yeah, that's, so that's a that, witness. yeah, yeah. And all of that, like what I went through and the things I've learned since then, I've been Orthodox um, almost eight years now. And I explored for about two years before becoming Orthodox. So I've been around Orthodoxy about 10 years now. Um, but a lot of what my coaching is, is walking people through similar processes to what, what I did and what Elder Thaddeus helped me with. And I later found out was just the whole tradition of the saints. Like he's, he's getting it from his elder, who's Elder Ambrose of Milkovo, the young elder. Elder Ambrose got it from St. Ambrose of Optina. And, and of course, most people know that a lot of people know the Optina elders are just like a treasure trove of, of grace and spiritual wisdom. And so um, I'm, I'm wor I work with people to uh, use, I, I'm a debater, but I've kind of learned similar to what you were talking about. Like there's a lot of times it just is, isn't a blessing to people to be arguing with them. And what I've learned is a kind of a backup use for being an arguer is helping people argue with invasive thoughts. 
So when they have a, like a, they're like, man, I just keep thinking about this all week. We kind of talk through the theology that refutes that invasive thought. And then we talk about making it into a prayer that they're going to use in those moments. And so that's what I had to do. Um, and this is a teaching you see across the fathers, they call it rebuttal. Um, the first the first line of defense with any invasive thought is to pray and ignore it. Um, mm -hmm. Like St. Paisio says, when the thoughts fly over, you that you just let them fly right by, you don't give them a place to land. But I say sometimes we already have troops on the ground. Like we've already listened to an invasive thought or we have a trauma or we have something chemical sometimes, um, which, doesn't mean a chemical solution of like medication. It might mean like a diet change or something like that, but that's beside the point. But the problem is, is sometimes we're already deeply affected by something negative and ignoring it just isn't enough. And that's when the fathers talk about things like um, rebuttal, uh, where you actually, you know, the thought keeps coming to you, nobody likes me. And so, you know, we might talk through typical therapist things of, well, does, does no one like you? Do you literally have Zero wait, wait. friends, like you. that sort of thing. You. Yeah. Theory. Okay. Uh, I want to know you. I'm going to focus on this word rebuttal because I come across this in the read in my readings sometimes. Like, okay, like I used to try to read the Philokalia and think, okay, I can read this. Now I'm a little older. I've been in the faith longer. And now I don't really think I can read the Philokalia right now at this moment. I'm. It's kind of, that's like the advanced spiritual text, you know, I can't really do that. But if you come across this, the power of rebuttal, can you maybe uh, define that for, for us? Uh, what do you think that, it, what, do, what does that mean to you? Rebuttal is addressing the, the, addressing the lies of the demon. Um, is, is like the simple, blunt, straightforward version. It's a, like the, the, something I say often to, to, clients and this is like something a lot of the stuff I, I like reading the fathers and then applying it to myself and then a little metaphor pops in my head or something um, you know simplifying things um, the scriptures describe the devil as the lion prowling about looking for someone to devour and our our mind and our heart is kind of like this city like there's meant to be you know Christ on the throne as the king of the city and then there's this room within the city for all for our hobbies and our work uh kind of like how cities have a specialty that they do each one of us has a specialty there's room for the the comings and goings of the people we love um but the demons prowl about outside the city going around the wall poking at spots looking for a spot that's weak that they can harass you and and destroy the peace of your city and and cause chaos um and so they're they're sending different invasive thoughts and some thoughts you know we have them and we're like why am i thinking that we just brush it off and we kind of without even thinking do what saint paisio said we just ignore it but other thoughts especially if there's a past trauma or an insecurity or it's related to like something really deep in our the purpose god has for us um like he calls us to to serve other people or to be a soldier and a warrior, whatever he calls us to. Um, maybe we're not meeting that currently. And so the demon goes, wow, you're such a failure. Like they'll, they'll prod and poke and look for that spot that gets us to react. And mm -hmm. the, the saints, it's interesting because you can approach this from a psychology side and the saint side and you get kind of the same advice, but the saint is deeper. Um, yeah. But this, I, the psychology. Uh, I always thought of rebuttals. So I kind of had come to this conclusion on my own. I don't know if this is necessarily true, but I thought that thinking about this power of, of rebuttal, it seems like an advanced technique to me. It seems like something that's maybe uh, a hesicast or, or an experienced monk might know how to use that. That's that. Ha that was like the uh, conclusion I had come to because like fighting against thoughts, like you're saying, this is like, it almost feels to me, in my experience, it's almost a hopeless battle, you know, like um, mm. the Jesus prayer, I think for me, that's like the probably the, the thing to focus on in my experience where I'm at right now. Using the Jesus prayer is probably the best thing, the best go to, you know. So I'm I'm uh, I'm ex I'm curious how 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 would you put this rebuttal to practice like? say the, yeah. you know you get this thought telling you something like how do you rebut the thought like you yeah do you, it's do you it's, speak to the demon do you say that's not true get behind me or what what is it yeah you're you so i would say you keep it very simple 
Um, it's not, it's not something like I kind of personally, I stay away from like talking to the demons at all. Um, like that's, that's definitely something for saints. But the problem is, is if the thought already has power over you, like it already stresses you out, like, like the thought pops in your head and you can't stop thinking about it. Like mm. you're trying to put the Jesus prayer and you can't stop. And that thing is just making you angry. You say something that is true, not because you're refuting the demons, even though what I just said was indirectly you are like, this is, this is like putting up a barrier so that, that what they're saying doesn't reach you. Like it's reinforcing it going over and just reinforcing. Um, and then after you do this, I would, I will tell people you go right to the Jesus prayer. So it's oh. something that's just like a barrier and then you turn back to Christ. Okay. Um, but it's, you know, if, if someone, if you, for example, feel like, like nobody loves me and you're, you're, that starts going through your head. Well, first of all, recognize that's destroying your peace, which is one of the basic signs, Elder Thaddeus and so many saints, St. Saint Isaac the Syrian, St. Paisios all talk about if it destroys your peace, it's very questionable if it's from God. Um, and so if it's just discouraging you and not making you trust God and you're dejected now, like that's a good sign. It's not from God. So once you, after a while of reading the saints, you start recognizing that you start being vigilant as the saints talk about, you notice, uh Oh, it's that thought again. And all that thought does is bad. It doesn't push me towards God. It doesn't bring me peace. It doesn't do any good. This oh. thought that no one loves me. And oh. so rebuttal would be going, stop. I have a bunch of people that love me. There's a bunch of people on Twitter who are my friend and care about me. There's a bunch of people at my parish who care about me. My priest cares about me. The saints care about me. That's the rebuttal is you say that just to yourself. So you're kind of mm -hmm. like removing the access. And then I would say, go right to the Jesus prayer, okay. but it kind of okay. cuts off the, the access. Uh, um, interesting. Yeah. So this is a, this is a spiritual warfare technique that you're talking about here. Yeah. Um, yeah. Invasive fighting invasive thoughts is spiritual warfare. Right. Like there's kind of no way around that. And psychology can help a little, but it's not enough. The right, saints right. know what's actually going on. So you think they're well, yeah. Okay. So there is some, some usefulness in psychology. Now you kind of, you kind of, uh, I want to bring you back a little bit because you kind of launched off. Uh, first of all, you said you chose your elder saint, your elder or your saint elder Thaddeus what is with the i've never seen this before i've never thumb, thumbs up oh interesting it must be a new youtube feature okay so elder thaddeus um he's not canonized how did you choose him as a saint because you can't really be baptized can you be bad you can't be baptized with the saint who hasn't been canonized right you you actually can um really? It, the the orthodox tradition is that that and this is what so so my journey to picking elder thaddeus there was just a i was looking at all these he was one of the first saints i read and he influenced me so much um but i i you know he wasn't on my radar he wasn't canonized and there were all these i liked prophet job and i liked saint Juvenali of of iliamna who i would recommend side note i'd recommend anyone go look up and learn about him he's wonderful and people Who's don't that? know about him uh, St. Juvenali. He was a friend of St. Herman. Um, okay. And he was martyred. It's a, it's a powerful story. There's an hour video on the OCA website. That's like the whole life of his. So if you want to learn about one of our amazing American saints that people, for some reason, I just happened on the video. That's the only reason I know. But anyways, I was looking at him and some other saints and I was talking to my future God brother and I, I was, he said, Hey, have you picked your saint yet? You know, your baptism's coming up. And I was like, yeah, I've got this list of like eight different ones I'm looking at. St. Sebastian Dabovich. Um, my legal name is Shay. So I was going to be St. I was going to be Shay Bastion. Uh, mm -hmm. My friends were already preparing for the nickname. And then he mentioned, I mentioned him offhand. I go, you know, it's, I wasn't even very, I wasn't serious at all, but I was like, it's too bad. Elder Thaddeus isn't a saint. Cause I might, I might consider him. And he goes, that's actually an orthodox tradition is when when a lot of people have testified to someone like they really are very recognized as being mm. holy you testify to the fact that you believe they should be canonized um, by taking their name and it was that was my moment that i knew that like elder thaddeus had picked me it was just like oh then i'm supposed to do that like that's uh, i i i'm called to do that i had so a, some, i had a friend who he wanted to be he wanted saint or Ella, Father Sarah from Rose to be his saint, and he asked the priest, and the priest said, "Well, he's not canonized, so you're going to have to choose another." So he just picked a different seraphim. Hmm. 
Yeah, and I was told, I know I know a couple other people that have taken Seraphim Rose and a couple people that have taken uh, Matushka Olga um, to, oh. you know, on the on the cusp of canonization right, scene. Right. So it's kind of like there's a, clo a very closeness. Um, like Elder Cleopa would be another good uh, candidate. But I was told by my priest that formally, whoever Elder Thaddeus's patron is, is technically my patron till he's canonized. But I didn't know who that was for about five years into being like oh, baptized. And I, I, it was a weird experience because I, I, one of my friends invited me to a random Discord server that was like 30 people from New Zealand who were Orthodox in this little server. One of them was a priest and I started to talk to him and talk about myself. And, and I mentioned I didn't know who, he asked me about, you know, Elder Thaddeus is your, is your patron. And I explained to him everything I just explained. And he goes, well, I'm friends with the monks at Vitovnica Monastery in Serbia. I can just ask them. And he gets back to me about five days later and he goes, the monks say Elder Thaddeus celebrated his feast day on December 29th, which is the feast of St. Thaddeus the Confessor, who is a, a martyr for icons. So mm -hmm. I didn't know who my official patron saint was for five years. But yeah, so technically that's my, my patron um, until the time that Elder Thaddeus is is canonized, which they announced uh, like a year or two ago. They're in the process. So oh, okay, answer to my prayers and my my baptism with his name. Um, so I don't think yeah. you mentioned. Do you want to like maybe briefly mention how you how you discovered the Orthodox faith? Yeah, I I'm a, a former non denom evangelical. Uh, I always call it evangelical, where it's like lightly charismatic and Pentecostal influenced. So I knew people that spoke at tongues, but no one did it like at church. They did it at home um or in other little groups but i eventually went to multnomah university which is a, a bible college in portland oregon um there's and there's always a trickle of converts from that bible college to orthodoxy there's a lot of other bible colleges like this too um and ended up invited by some friends that went to the Bible college and were converting to orthodoxy invited by them to a service and i hated it so much i prayed it would end um, God did not answer that prayer. He has a sense of humor. Two years later, I was Orthodox. Wait, which um, parish was that? Uh, St. George's. It's an Antiochian parish in Portland. Okay. I think it's a big white one, right? It's like, white, I think big, so. Yeah. yeah. I think yeah, I've been very, to that one. Cause yeah, I it's, it's awesome. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah over near the Gresham area. Right. Right. Um, yeah. I'm pretty sure. I, I'm pretty sure I visited that once. Okay. Yeah. That's where, that's where I converted under uh, father Alban West. Um, and yeah, it was, it was, I spent about three months. So after, after having some conversations with some of the, the fellow Bible college students, you know, they, they proposed enough hard questions to me that I was like, okay, okay, I got to look into this just to like do my due diligence. Mm -hmm. And after about three months of looking up church history to prove the Orthodox wrong, I had to admit to myself that I had done the exact yeah. opposite. That's I couldn't be thing. Protestant anymore. I wasn't warning. even ready to be Orthodox, but right, right. couldn't be warning. Protestant. This is a warning to uh, non-Orthodox out there. Do not try to prove the Orthodox wrong. <laughs> I've heard this before. You will become Orthodox. It's, it's a futile exercise. Exercise in futility. Okay, so um, yeah. I want to talk about... Okay, so I'm going to explain to you that... Uh, we do talk about mental health issues here. Um, since I have, uh, I myself have a serious mental illness. And so from time to time, we do streams on this. I talked with Father Turbo. We talked about um, despair. And uh, I've talked, I've kind of given some of my own stories over the, over the years that I've been doing this. Um, so you have a psychology degree. I mean, how can you... I was watching your video on this and you were basically you were basically using like kind of like orthodox psychotherapy the book you know you you read that book it's um it's not really talking about psychotherapy at all it's talking about the method of the church to heal the human soul and the 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 church had basically can address a lot of uh mental health problems just for exa for example depression the church basically has the cure, you know, for a lot of anxiety, angst, uh, existential uh, dilemmas. Um, 
So how do you think, what, what is your, what is your approach to let's, let's talk, let's take two different mental health problems, like serious. Do you think that the, how do you have thoughts on uh, the application of the therapeutic method of the church towards serious mental illness, as opposed to just depression or something lesser like that? Do yeah. I mean, there's, there's some, some depression that's pretty, pretty serious, but I, I get what you're saying. Um, right. Yeah. Right. It's, so, so first of all, like if I encounter stuff that's, that's like people are really going through it. Like, um, psych like some, I'm talking about schizophrenia and manic, you know, mania, bipolar, schizophrenia, yeah. or this kind yeah, of thing. Yeah. So, so when it like, comes to, when it comes to my practice, if it's serious enough, I'll refer out. Like I'll say, Hey, like get someone who specializes in this. Um, I usually will see if even one meeting, maybe two or three we can have, because on the other hand, um, orthodoxy, orthodox spirituality, and I think this is kind of the balance of like, well, where do we bring in psychology? Where do we, you know, rely on orthodoxy? Orthodoxy has to be your foundation. You lay a foundation of, of an, I, I would call it orthodox phronema, an orthodox mindset of why, what am I on this planet for? Repentance. What is repentance? Metanoia, change of noose, turning the heart back to God, changing it back to God. Like, that's what I'm on this planet for. Why am I suffering? Why does God allow mental illnesses? These really hard questions. He allows them because they are used as medicine for the hard heart, making it soft before him, making it receptive to him. Like, and this is, you know, this is, we could go really in deep. I'm kind of like fast forwarding through it. But these, these kinds of things are the foundation you need to lay. And then well, first of all, and I talk about this in that uh, Orthodoxy is Therapy video. Um, that's my, my most popular video on my channel. Um, I talk about how you'll be surprised thing, by living the Orthodox spiritual life. Stuff will be, there's, I always say there's three categories. Some stuff goes away. Some stuff really goes away. Um, some of the controversy around me is that I've been public that 10 years ago I struggled with gender dysphoria. Um, and that's kind of being misunderstood and misinterpreted, unfortunately, but I help people struggle with gender dysphoria sometimes because there's not because I'm an expert, but because compared to anyone else, I'm an expert just because no one else knows what to do with it. It's very okay. new. Okay. Um, wanna, can I break in? Um, sure. so I do want, I did want to touch on this subject cause I knew that you were public about that. Um, do you want to address this? issue now before uh, oh we could we could address it later because we might we might like you know go go in deep with it but um okay. the the thing i'll just like wrap up kind of the point i'm getting to is that um some stuff goes away and for me that was something that as i lived the orthodox spiritual life and i did this self-searching it alleviated okay. some things the second category is some things lessen they become a lot less extreme because the, the spiritual side really almost like contains them in a level that's more therapeutic rather than dominating us and depressing us and all these things. And then the, the third category is some things stay because they're a cross that the Lord is allowing for our salvation. But we don't know which is which until we live the spiritual life and the spiritual life, whichever category certain issues hit, we have a piece about it that makes it purposeful and meaningful and easy to bear and leads to the Lord. And after you address that, after you lay the spiritual life and the foundation, which is why I said, I'll, I'll if I can have a couple sessions with someone, even if I'm going to refer them out just to kind of like talk to them, like, Hey, this is, this is like one of the big struggles is people asking like, why does God let me sin? Like if he wants me to stop sinning, why does, why does he let me sin? Um, and if you want to, if you want to, explore that i have a little short story on my website called the explorer that i highly recommend it has some church father teachings at the end it's all about like why would god let us sin if he doesn't like us to sin um right. but that's something people need help with like how that god allows sin for a purpose god allows the wrestling with temptations for a purpose but once you have this mindset this phronema you understand the basic way to approach any of your struggles then that's where you start to have clarity on what you might need psychology's help with, um, what you might need to go to a therapist for, what you might need to ask your spiritual father for a blessing to go talk to a therapist. And right. so I see it as you first deal with the spiritual life and then you 
And you could do this quickly if it's urgent, if you're stuff suffering from severe mental health issues. But then after that, and on that foundation can come psychology. And then if it's extreme enough, rare cases, I, I think it should be rare, but I'm not totally against it, medication. But the way we go right to medication in the secular world, we all, most of us know that that's really concerning, but it's right. the, it's the backup plan that comes with the blessing of the spiritual father after you've done the first one and then you've done trauma work and then you, you know, okay. Yeah. There are, there are times I've, you know, brought up issues with my priest or my spiritual father, um, psych, psych, psychiatric, psychological problems. And, and often sometimes they'll just say, yeah, that is something you should talk to your psychiatrist about. You know, mm. so I've been directly referred to psychiatrists from my priest or my confessor. Mm. Um, yeah, and a lot of it's it's interesting how often because there's uh, coming from the Protestant background, there's like this debate and argument between like, is it demons that cause mental health problems and whatever? And I think an orthodox view is it's generally both. You know, like I said, the demons go around the wall looking for those weak spots. We have trauma, we have genetic things, we have personality predispositions that are sometimes just gifts from God. But what what are what are our passions and our weaknesses and our mental health issues, whatever category you want to pick, they're you they're off some of them are inversions of our strength. Um, St. Maximus the Confessor talks about this that e uh, evil lies not in sexuality but in lust. Evil lies not in food but in gluttony evil lies not in created things, but in their misuse. And a lot of times like God may make us a, a person who's meant to be kind, extra gentle with people. And if we don't turn that to him and live an ascetic life, like practicing submitting that to him, then we become nice people who weaponize our kindness to make sure there's no conflict and, and no one thinks bad of me and whatever. And that's the perversion of what is a gift. And the opposite is true too. Some men God makes and, and some women, God makes very strong-willed protectors and defenders and blunt. And if they are submitting that to God, it, it, is a, it is a protective strength for the church. And if they don't, they become really belligerent and rude and offensive and push people away from the church. So it's not about like this debate that's happening with some people online of like meanness or no meanness. It's submitting everything to the will of God. Um, so if I'm going to be rude and blunt to someone, well, there's a couple saints that do that, but are you going to pray and are you going to make sure it's God's will before you do it? Um, and so these are going back to the psychology subject. Um, a lot of times when the demons are messing with us, they're, they're messing with something that might actually be this valid thing. Like maybe it's our personality and our strength and our gift God gave us. Maybe it's a trauma and then they exacerbate it. And that's why you want to deal with the spiritual life because then whatever's left, you know, that's going to be like something that might be also psychological. But if you start assuming it's all psychological and the demons are influencing you, it stays convoluted and even the therapy doesn't like fully work. So orthodoxy offers the, the possibility of a holistic healing program. Absolutely. So uh, you did uh, mention you just were, I mean, you kind of said that's a good way to segue into the next section of our talk. Um, you were talking about being online. And this was one of the things we were going to focus on today. Um, so what what advice do you have to pe for people about uh, being orthodox online? Mm. Yeah, it's it's something that I mean, I've been I've been on orthodox Twitter, like active for probably about five years now. And when when I first started, I was definitely someone who was like, arguing and accusing people of pride and like playing little like games of like, Oh, I got to reveal how you're prideful, which is of course pride. <laughs> um, but like I was doing all that. And then I reached this very enlightened stage where I realized that judging people isn't okay. And so the next thing I did was tone police. Any Orthodox person who was like judging someone else, I would judge them. I would go and be like, Hey, you're not supposed to talk like that. Here's like five saints quotes, whatever. Like, and, and it was, I, I realized after that stage that that was actually worse than the first one. Cause the first one I was at least ignorant, but when you claim to know better and yet you do the same things, Paul talks about this with the Jews and Romans, like you're accusing all them and you do the same things they do. Uh, like that's what I was doing. So it was actually worse because I was a, a hypocrite on top of being judgmental. Okay. And I, I've started to realize more recently that the only ap approach that's truly orthodox in my opinion is 
God is handling everything. I am not the linchpin in any work that God needs done. When God wanted to convert the per Saul, the persecutor of Christians, he showed up and he did it himself and converted him to Paul. God doesn't need me. And the idea that God needs me to argue with, with inquirers and argue with LGBT people and argue with my fellow Orthodox about how they're, they're too judgmental and this isn't what our saints say. Like it's, it's this spirit of pride that is the same spirit in, as you read in this, in the ecumenism, in uh, the Tower of Babel, in heresies and schisms, all the same spirit of my trusting my own power. That's the very thing we're warring with as Orthodox. Like it's that spirit. And so we have to approach like the monastics and the saints call us to over and over. Everything is fine. The one thing you should be worried about wherever you are at work with your family on social media, stranded on a desert island, the one thing you should worry about is your own repentance. That's what I have to call myself back to every time I start in another goofy debate. I know in my conscience, I don't need to be in. I, there's that point where I often, you know, a brother or something, which I'm very thankful for, will message me and be like, do you think you should be in this debate? And I'm like, oh, thank you. Uh, what like, was it? What was it? <laughs> glory to God for sending your servant. So yeah. I like, I like what you said about repentance. If we're repenting, we're on the right path. Uh, what was it? You said you got some good advice recently from someone. What was the, the best advice someone recently told you about your Twitter arguments? Yeah. Uh, when, when the, like over the last month, there was, there was all the, all the, the drama that got you to, to connect with me. Um, and there were, there were like my friends, a couple of my clients messaging me and being like, Hey, are you all right? Like with this stuff they're saying about you, whatever. And I was like, I've, I'm kind of used to it and I, and it's been a good opportunity to practice like what the saints say, like, thank you're supposed to thank God for this stuff. And I'm like, I don't want to thank God, <laughs> but like it's, it's, it really has helped my heart. And I see, I see the saints know what they're talking about as much as my ego does not want to do it. It really, it, it is, it brings so much peace and it slowly has bothered me less, but I, I appreciated, you know, like that I have friends that support me um, and whatever, but one, one, acquaintance i don't i don't know him super well message me and i would sum up what he said was have you considered shutting up have you considered not writing a big long like you know you paid for twitter blue fill that whole thing up like thousands of characters you know explaining this isn't true and how dare they and stuff and as soon as he said it to me i was just like he's right I should that, do what the saints say and just like to, shut up. I, yeah, I want to second that. So here's a good tool. This is a tool that Orthodox use even offline. And that is just no response. Sometimes I, you know, we, we, when you when you just stop, no response, that will get the other person thinking, you know, maybe per, say a prayer or something like that. But that's always a good option, especially on Twitter. I try not to. I've been the center of attention before where I got one tweet that went like a hundred over a hundred thousand views and everyone hated me for a week. And mostly that was probably because that was the only, the one and only time they had ever seen me before mm. or heard, heard of me. You know, the people who knew me already there, they didn't, they didn't think much of it. You know, they were like, okay. But um I dig it's hard not when you're like when it's in the heat of the moment, it's hard not to get a little wrapped up and send a tweet, you know, but for the most part, I, I mean, well, I, I don't, I don't know. I haven't, I'm not very active on Twitter, you know? Um, so it's not like a big, a big problem from, for me personally, but just shut up. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it, like you said, it really, it makes, it's the, it's the, Something I've learned to, to ask myself, like really ask myself is, is if I say my goal is to, you know, glorify, bring glory to God into his church and to win other people over, am I asking myself, is what I'm doing actually the best way to accomplish that? And most of the time the answer is no. And it's crazy how fighting your ego and living the life of repentance, exactly what the saints and scriptures tell us, and sometimes I listen to, like actually living that is actually the best chance to do that. Um, like you said, sometimes it gets the other person to think. And what's weird is, is 
this some of this drama was happening like the last time it happened was this summer and i i really at that time i was like okay i'm just supposed to thank god and try and not argue with people about it and what was weird I, my fear was this this you know this would hurt my business this is how i make my living is my coaching practice this is how i get a place to stay and and food to eat um and so this is someone attacking my ability to like so take care of job? myself you're, yeah. you're, you're hold, you support yourself through that? Through this I online? do. Yeah. Wow. Um, yeah. And I, I live with a roommate. So the rent it like to cut down on rent and whatever, but right. I'm doing, I'm doing something that I love and that brings me joy. Um, and so like, I would rather live, you know, whatever, whatever simple life it takes to do that than like be rich doing a job I hate. So, um, but it's, yeah, it's it. So it scared me at the time. And then I just felt like, the saints say, if you do what the Lord says, he takes care of you, which I'm like, well, clearly my heart doesn't believe that, but I'm going to try and like, try and live by that. And after, after kind of everything fizzled down, I had two people come and say, Hey, we're interested in your coaching. And I said, how'd you find me? And they're like, well, we, we liked how you responded to the people criticizing you. Mm. And I didn't say anything. It wasn't like I responded with charity or something. I just was, was quiet, which was already i mean i'm, I'm not right. gonna lie that's, it was hard to do I, said, I thought you've handled it well because i didn't see a lot of you know lashing out or you know trying to too much trying to strike back or anything like that yeah I, that's that's my goal i mean if you i told i told my friend who uh told me to shut up i was like hey don't go look at my twitter replies um because i was still like if i would see someone i would like you know say like hey that's not true like that's not what's going on um but i did delete like some of my main posts like these big diatribes and whatever that were just oh, okay. just made me look just revealed that i'm i have my own ego so who, who am i to judge um but it's even like even when i'm if i'm talking to someone who's like dating someone or has a conflict with someone at work um, and i get a lot of this from elder thaddeus because he talks about this a bunch um but i always I always tell them you know when when we think someone is flawed and we criticize them and then they criticize us back or do something back to us you know in their mind they were they were in the right because we did something to them but in our mind once they react to what we did we feel vindicated for what we judged them for originally and so the ego is contagious like we infect other people and they infect us and we so unless someone is willing to take a totally different path of bearing the sins of other people which is what christ does he bears the evil of people and still loves them. That's the payment that he he gives. As if we start asking his help, we can't do that without his help, um, or it just turns to pride. But if we're humbly asking for his help to do that, then we infect them with humility, God willing. You know, if it's actually God in us helping us. And so, what what you'll see, for example, with spouses sometimes is this: one spouse argues with the other spouse, and they argue back and forth, and then one of them just just decides to live this ascetic life and just be like everything that happens is sent by god if my spouse is grouchy i'm just gonna pray and handle as best i can and then after a while their spouse calms down and something that that happens is that the person you're actually kind of disarming them um like you don't want to make it the goal to fix them but god you these just are the natural orders of god's ways um when when you start being peaceful it helps the person face the fact that you're not the one causing their problems and they need to face what's going on inside themselves. But if you keep lashing back at them, justified by what they did and the vengeance just goes back and forth, they'll always feel validated and they never are forced to face themselves. But your peace will actually dis disarm them from having someone to blame. And that actually forces them the best chance they've ever had to go, you know, my spouse is peaceful and I'm still stressed and she's very kind to me what's going on in me and so you know silence that's just one random example but it really like what the saints teach works it works it's not just like oh cool spiritual advice it's not just make you feel better it's not just like god's rules he wants you to do it really is the order of creation and the order of the spiritual realm and the order of our hearts so it's it's the power <clears throat> it's the power of orthodoxy nice i like that okay um so how about uh, let's, the, the uh, topic of the application of spiritual life uh, online? Like, how do we like this is a new this is a whole new thing. You know, this this Internet thing is probably a couple decades old now. So 
how do we use that and how do we how do we uh live out the spiritual life online like i i think i think it goes it goes back to that idea of uh something i i say often like i got i kind of scrapped this together from a bunch of saints but i always say the one thing the world needs from us is our repentance like i was saying earlier and i think if you wanted something practical um you know we have we have prophet job in the old testament saying the lord gives and the lord takes away blessed be the name of the lord um naked i came from my mother's womb and naked shall i return we have uh saint paul saying all things work together for the good of those who love god we have saint john chrysostom dying from horrible pain and exile and saying glory to god in all things which is like what what protestants when they say praise the lord we say glory to god in all things um that's a, one of our arrow prayers and then we have um our our modern saints uh saint paisios tells us say in everything literally everything thank you god as this was necessary for our, our salvation i think this this alone i mean it's hard to do easier said than done um but if we just did this practice constantly while we were on social media every person that annoys us every person that frustrates us every person that has a false teaching the first thing we see is god sent this person because to reveal my weakness if we start seeing that constantly and we tap into that it it, it changes everything it, it won't just change this one interaction this is what we're called to in everything. This is what we're called to in our job, in our family, and everything. It is all sent by God for our salvation. We go so far, and this is what my, my short story, The Explorer, is about. We go so far to say that even our falls into sin, when you repent, God turns them into something that is extremely salvific. He turns, mm. he turns feces into the compost of virtues. Right. Like the virtue you want to develop is this little plant. And the the repentance of oh my gosh lord i'm so without this virtue yeah and your that glory, comes from it and your glory is the the glory of a person who has repented from sin is even greater than the person who's never sinned yeah he who is forgiven much loves much as christ says okay um so i do want to talk about this uh transgenderism gender dysphoria uh because it's this is kind of a new phenomenon from from what i see when i was in when i was growing up i'm probably 10 years older than you you know you never heard of we never heard of transgender growing up it was not a thing nobody struggled with it it wasn't a it wasn't an issue nowadays i've come across you know i i've for example like i've gone I've, I've come across, I've met a lot of people who are Orthodox, okay? And I've, to, to my surprise, people have come out and even admitted, you know, around me that they have struggled with this. And I was surprised, like, this looks like normal, even a masculine male. I never thought, never would have occurred to me that this person would have had that struggle. And I don't know where it's coming from. I, I have two, I have two ideas. I think this definitely there is a spiritual component where there there must be a demon who is kind of leading the you know this there there must be a demon you know behind this that that has to be a, there must be a spiritual re reality to to this problem. The other thing that I'm thinking is it's in the water. It's all the chemicals. It's the, it's it's the food. It's the goy slop. You know, it's uh, the medications that people are on. It's the, these things must there must be a physical component to to it, too. These are just the thoughts I've had about it. Now, you you said that you had a period of time where you went through this. What are your insights and, and maybe respond to what, what what my my guess guesses are? Ultimately, they're just guesses. I, I, I think both of those are factors for sure. I mean, the demons are, are like greedy capitalists they'll if there's if there's a sin to to cash in on i mean a, a brokenness in a human to prey upon they're gonna do it so to me that's just like a given um and so that's definitely there um i also think uh, our food is is a key part of mental health crisis that's been a key part of my journey was after i did the elder thaddeus stuff and you heard me make references to this earlier 
um, like nutrition. I found out I had certain food allergies and certain gut problems, which I'm still several gut years problems. into. Yes, gut problems are very common these days. Yeah, and I very much think it's all the different processed food. I don't even know if it's soy so much as soybean oil. Like I'm very much oh. not a fan of seed oils. Right. Uh, seed oil, and, yeah. Th that's and so they mess with your neurochemistry. And so we have like like depression, for example, we use the word depression. I talk about this in my in in the one video on orthodoxy and therapy we use the word depression to mean uh dejection where i'm sad about life um but there's also a neurochemical thing that's very valid it doesn't mean that the solution is to go pop a pill in fact i think that the uh, majority of the time that's really risky sometimes that is the case that you need that but um a lot of times it's like you change your diet and suddenly uh people go on the carnivore diet i've, I've heard thousands literally thousands i went on a deep dive into carnivore and i've done it a bit myself and it was so helpful um and the and the mainstream media the mainstream nutrition uh diatribe is this is so bad it's so dangerous and you go read online like your theories are trumped by reality uh, really, some people go so far as to say humans are carnivores we're not omnivores we're carnivores yeah i I'm, that might be a little extreme but uh, I don't know. Maybe not. Maybe you can not, you can survive on the average person. I would say could survive on meat, and there's all these yeah. scientific reasons for that that aren't talked about. Um, right. You don't need sugars and carbs if right. you're getting fat from ketones, all that stuff. It's but not that's an essential. carbs aren't essential. I'm trying to do for the past six months. I've been trying and failing keto because keto apparently is really good for a lot of mental problems. It's this new. Have you heard about this uh, metabolic psychiatry? Yeah, 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 I'm I'm eating you're, keto right now for you're for doing keto? mental health. Yeah, yeah, I'm I so I might ask you some questions after, or we can even talk about it now. Like, do you like do you did you have some? How did you do you have someone you're working with helping you, or did you just figure it out yourself? Because I've had a lot of, I have really struggled with keeping this diet, keeping to it, and getting ketones up in my blood. You know. Yeah, I'm I'm pretty I'm pretty new. I've done it on and off. Um, but I would not consider myself an expert. I've gotten I've gotten help from random different people, including one one Orthodox friend who's a doctor that keto like changed his life. Um, and the carnivore he did carnivore, it healed a bunch of problems, and then he switched to keto, and he's been fine. Um, that's what a lot of people do. Um, yeah. But I've just noticed like for all I have lots of weird little symptoms and stuff. Um, and when I'm eating beef and eggs. That like I could just eat that for a few days, and I notice I start to feel better. Um, so uh, yeah, I don't. I'm not. I'm not an expert, but I've I have enough experience with it to at least say for me, I know it helps me a lot. Um, mm -hmm. But I I think these I think this is like one example of many things that contribute to the the transgender phenomenon. Um, I I would say kind of two things are going on, and you can see this in the history of the subject because there was cross-dressing and drag queens and men who craved this sexual fantasy of that they are women for a long time. That's been around a long time. And it's, I would say it might be slightly different thing. I think Father Josiah Trenum says something similar. Um, there's a lot of people, he, Father Josiah uh, gave, has a four part lecture series on patristic nectar on the transgender movement. Excellent, really good. Um, I don't think, it goes deep into the solutions, but I think that's because it's still so new, but he does an excellent job exploring the history, refuting a lot of the lies. Um, so it's it's like a key resource in my mind. Um, sure. But I think I, I'm really interested in digging into like, what's actually going on and how Here, is that addressed? Here's an idea I had. What do you think? Do you think it was trans fat that is causing trans? <laughs> Boom. That, I mean, you, that spoilers, that was what I was getting. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it's so, so the, the, I, I believe it's called, I should know that I should memorize this term because I want to talk about it. Uh, uh, autogynophilia, the, the, the fantasy that you are a woman and that being a sexual fantasy. Um, I, the way that I explain it is that that I, I believe it's some, so when it comes to psychology, I got to make this footnote here. When it comes to psychology, 
we really want to put things in one box. We want to do this with every subject, every science, every person. We want to put them in the one box. The truth is it's way too complicated. There's demons, there's diet, there's all this stuff going on. So I don't want to say that this is every single person. But I think very common, there is some misbonding, misability with women from the male. And what the, the autogynophilia is, it is the attempt to simulate the energy of womanhood that would come from a real woman within yourself and feel that wholeness and completeness. So wow. you're, you're kind of cheating and saying, I'm going to be woman myself and feel the, the union, but it's not real. Like you're wanting something you're supposed to want, which is my wife. Um, you're, you're supposed to want one, one thing I, I used to explain it is, um, scripture talks about how not, not scripture, sorry, the saints like uh, St. Maximus and St. Simeon, the new theologian, they talk about how creation is a garment that Christ wears creation and is, is God's garment. And I think there is something in the symbolism of and this sounds weird to say out loud, but uh, the woman as the garment of man, like she, um, a man with his wife that he has loved her well and she loves him well. Um, she is this testimony to who he is as a man. Um, and you see this when, like, for example, she might be wearing a flower dress with roses all over it, like it, pictures of roses. And then he has a rose that's the same color on his shirt. And that's like the perfect compliment. If he wears a rose suit, it looks awkward there. But we, we see that we're like, oh, why are you wearing both the same outfit? But if he has a suit and he has a rose and it matches her, there's almost this pairing that just like our brain and our mind, our heart sees that as natural. And I think this is the, the cheating way to have that bond. Um, yeah. And then there's, so that's the first issue. Then there's the second issue of um, this, uh, Father Josiah, I think a lot of the people are calling it rapid onset gender dysphoria. This is the new thing. And this is what tons of middle school girls are getting out of nowhere after they've been online. Where I believe this comes from, and I, I tap into orthodoxy here too, is when man has a, so man is meant to be a priest. And if you want to hear me talk, I'm just going to cover it really briefly. If you want to hear me talk about this a lot, I did an interview with Brother Augustine, uh, Michael Whitkoff, going really in depth on this specifically. Um, but, the, but the simple version is man is meant to be a priest. And part of what that means, means a lot of different things, but part of what that means is he is the bridge, the, the symbol, the link. Um, in the in the patristic sense of the word symbol, the link between the physical and the spiritual. He is he has a body and he has a spirit and he's together. And when he unites with God and he interacts with creation, he unites them. He introduces God's love to the animals, and the saints say Saint Paisios talks about this. The animals are filled with God's love. He works with objects through prayer and through the sacraments and those objects become holy and those objects like him actually have god in them like the ark did in the old testament and this is our whole job as humans like since adam and eve is to be these bridges so what this looks like in our everyday life is that when we have something going going on inside of us we have this urge and craving to get it out of us we'll use like psychology perspective we'll say like i haven't processed this emotion but what is processing well, I talk about it. Okay, now this symbolism of words is carrying what's going on inside of me. I write a song about it. I make art about it. And suddenly, you know, you you rap, you know what it's like to get what is inside of you out in rap and to be like, yeah, there I said it. Like that's that's priesthood. Creativity in that way is actually like this this lower but totally Christian form of priesthood. When we make art, we're expressing ourselves. This is what we're doing in therapy. We need that connection with someone else, but we just need to get it out. Some people journal and they sh there's evidence that that's like hugely helpful to mental health. So tying all this back into the gender dysphoria stuff, it is also a great concern because sometimes we project our problems onto a symbol that isn't actually the problem. Um, we do this with political parties. We do this with that anonymous person on Twitter that we don't see their face. So we think they're a jerk or a road rage. We do this everywhere. And one of the things that therapists are, are trained very much to be careful about is that they can do this with a client. Like they can, you know, a client says, oh, I have this fear. And, and they can go, well, that sounds like it's probably linked to your dad. And what they're doing is what you 
technically is accidental hypnosis. They're accidentally or intentionally, politicians can do this, um, but they're accidentally implanting a thought that especially uh, some people are more suggestible, might take and then link. So if you're telling all these susceptible, emotional young girls, you know, all the normal stress of being a middle school girl, going through puberty, liking boys, uh, retreating from boys, maybe being abused, maybe real traumas from their dad, that's because maybe you're actually a boy. All of their trauma is being pushed on that. And, and it, it, we attach to stuff. Once we've said, you know, like this political party is going to save me, then we're terrified at any evidence that contradicts our political view, left or right, whatever it is. Like we get terrified when our idols are, are, are threatened to be smashed. Um, we won't, we hide them under the, the saddle we, as the Old Testament says, we don't want to reveal them. Well, once you've put all your pain in, once I transition, that's going to solve all my problems. The suicide rate skyrockets after transition, something that the, the modern movement does not want to tell you. You're killing people if you don't want them to transition. No, you're killing people. You are killing people if you encourage them to, if you do push them that way. And unfortunately, I think this is what's happening with this new movement um, is that we're, we're, we're hypnotizing. I think that word has become cliche, but it is a real thing. Um, we're suggesting to young girls to put their trauma on this wrong thing. And suddenly I want to cut my breasts off because my breasts are the symbol that contain all my pain. And if I could just get them off me, then the pain would be gone. And then it's not. So that's, I, I, I think that's the simplest version of what's actually happening. But you can see, going back to the very beginning of this conversation, you can see how the demons would totally whisper to someone, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, cut it off. And you it. can see yeah. how diet issues and unhealthy foods causing mental illness problems, they're going to project the pain from their mental illness on the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So I would, that's kind of all of it in a nutshell. Okay. And now, okay, so we have the problem and how, how from a spiritual perspective, church, you know, church life, how do we heal from this problem? What does the church provide as an answer? Yeah, there's, so there's a lot of things, obviously the church, I mean, how many writings and books do we have and, and advice just from one elder fills a whole book. Um, there's, there's a lot, but I would say a couple, like the first things where I would start with, I mean, where I start with myself, um, a couple different things. So first of all, Elder Thaddeus was the one who introduced me to this thanking God when we suffer. And I think, you know, this obviously, like I know some people hear this and I think rightly so they go, oh, I can't, I can't just do that. And it's like, no, no, you can't. But I think for the average person and something we want to try and integrate is, if we can, is whatever the thing is that's bothering us, thanking God because it's necessary for our salvation, exactly like St. Paisio says. And what that does is rather, when we have pain, it, it's kind of like a pipe that has nowhere to go and, it, and the pressure builds. Um, there's a samurai that said, I can suffer anything if it has meaning. And the problem is a lot of time our suffering, we don't know what, 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 could, this, th what could this horrible thing I'm going through possibly be good for. Um, Job is a great example of this because not only does he lose his family, uh, have his wife tell him to curse God and die, have these t uh, friends that kind of like gaslight him and preach the prosperity gospel at him. Like, and then he gets all these, this sickness. The worst part that caps it all off, the most existentially terrifying thing is that he has no answer. And that's what he's begging for the whole time. He's not even asking God, take this stuff away. He's saying, why? I need an answer. Why? There's, there's, that is the ultimate capstone. So Knowing why we're why God would let us suffer, which is a very hard question, is very key to our our mental and spiritual health. And so that's one of the places you start is is because these things soften our heart and and burn away passions when we when we combine them with prayer and thanksgiving and make us able to receive God. And with God comes life, with God comes love, and not just the peace of love from him, like when we know, oh my gosh, he, I've seen now long enough doing this, he really does take care of me. But also other people feel that peace and other people have divine love flowing through us. That's our whole goal, as our whole goal, love God, return his love to him, thine own of thine own we offer unto thee, as we say in the, the liturgy, and also to give his love to, to people, animals, and the rest of creation. So 
So that is why that is the technical answer. You can't just say this to any person who's suffering. Um, but it, when we're in a conversation like this, you can say, this is why God lets us suffer because it really does burn away everything that stands between us and him. It's not, it's not punishment. It's not him being retributive. It is him giving us the medicine. So he's the holy physician. So we need to know this and apply this in our prayer in the moments when we're having whatever it is, if we're feeling gender dysphoric feelings, um, like I, I, I would encourage someone if they, if they, you know, talk to their spiritual father and feel comfortable saying this, saying something like, you know, if the dysphoria comes say, oh Lord, give me strength to fight this. And thank you for giving me a battle that pushes me closer to you. That's something you see in a lot of the saints. Um, another thing you see is, uh, there's a book. I, if you really want to dive into some orthodoxy and some psychology just in in perfect unison but with orthodoxy as the authority it always should be the authority um mother silowana vlad is a romanian nun that ran a counseling center and she has a book called god where is the wound um and one of the things she offers for i i would apply this to gender dysphoric stuff and traumas and anything is to actually she says and the way she's wording it is is she just says turn the pain into a prayer because if you're sick, you have a virus and then maybe you cough. But if you cover the cough, like you don't act out, you're still sick. We think the problem is that we're doing all these bad deeds and those are a problem. Certainly the trespasses against God, but those are symptoms of a deeper illness and that's what God wants to heal. So when we're acting out or, or when we're in pain, all of those things are the symptom of a brokenness. So pain is actually, you're feeling the fact that something in you is dying. It's always, always the experience of death, suffering, pain. They're always the experience of death. Like something in me is not right. It's not according to nature. It's not according to God. When we sin, it's the same thing. All of these things are symptoms of sin. That's why sin will say like you're suffering because of sin. And people will think that's like judicial, but it's very much like a medical concept because they're also linked in orthodoxy. But she says, when, when your pain comes into your con when your when your brokenness comes into your consciousness as pain like the thing the broken thing hurts i have a headache that means something's wrong in here but i don't like something can be wrong and i don't have a headache um but when you when it comes into your consciousness you're the symbol you're the priest bring god through prayer to the other from the other end sit there with your pain and say lord come into my pain work through it to heal me and if it's your will heal what's causing this pain and so it, it becomes this way that God directly comes into us and, and addresses the pain and enters into it as is how she describes it. But it also makes the pain this really, really deep, vulnerable prayer. Because when you're hurting, you, you need, you want help very badly. Um, and so it's a time when God, uh, the saints say God is very near to those who are in pain. Um, so that's, that's the second thing. Um, I'm going to give a third thing, one last thing um, that's specific to gender dysphoria. Because those, like I said, you want to start with the spiritual foundation and those are universal. Literally any pain, even the pain of I just sinned and I feel so ashamed, turn that into prayer. That's what the saints tell us to do. Ask and even thank yeah, God. That's what I do. Yeah. So turn it, turn it into prayer. Do not hide from God. Um, don't hide from him. Uh, be humble. But I mean, if you're feeling shame, you're going to be humble already. You're going to be like, ah. so just go to him with humility. Um, but the third thing specific to gender dysphoria, this was how, this was key to how I healed. I think for a lot of people, there's different stuff going on. Um, it's, it's more complex. This is not going to work for everyone, but I was someone who really didn't relate to a lot of the masculine archetypes. And I kind of had to, my whole journey is kind of finding almost, I would say a back door to masculinity. Cause I didn't want to be it wasn't just that I, I wanted to be woman. It was that I didn't like being man. Like that word made me uncomfortable. Now, by the mercy of God, I like being a man. I, I like it. I've found some my own flavor of masculinity. Each man has his own flavor, but at the core is the same spirit God planted there. Um, but <clears throat> part of what I had to do, and this is some weird people out sometimes. I think, you know, if we explored it a lot, I could explain even more, but I think a lot of people will get it. But a lot of times you have to be neutral. You, you have to be, you don't, so, so I'll give an example of how I, if I encounter someone who is like really big on the pronouns thing and they're like, like, like they're a, 
you know, a dude and they don't want to be called he, him. They find that offensive. I won't call them, I generally won't call them she, her. Like, I, I can't do it. That's wrong. I, I won't affirm it. It's entering into untruth. It's just disconnecting from reality for me. And I don't want to feed it in them. But provoking them isn't good either. Most of the time, what I will do is I will say they, them. And sometimes I'll ask, like, if I'm really forced into an interaction I can't get out of, um, I will ask, I was like, is it okay if I call you they, them? And usually they'll be like, oh, yeah, you've conceded enough to me. But that's a, that's a great way for me because they are they, them. So I'm not violating the bounds of truth. I'm not encouraging them in their illness, but I'm also not trying to force them into a state they're not ready for. I believe that this is a mental illness. Um, and, and the left will find that super insulting. Um, but that that's a call to grace if we really believe that. Like if I meet someone who's in like a, having a psychotic break, you don't force them like, no, that's not reality. Like that doesn't help a person at all. So if this is mental illness, we don't, we don't affirm them, but we also don't force them into the thing that they're, whatever reason, pride or trauma, it's not my business to judge such a thing. It's usually a mix of both anyways. Um, not my place to force them. But uh, as, as a little metaphor for this, when a, when a kid at, tries to pronounce a word, like say, if they're trying to say like uh, elephant and they're like effluent, some people ask like, do I say no, elephant? Or do I say yes, effluent? The answer is you say yes, elephant. If they go effluent and they can't fix it, you say yes, elephant. So you're guiding them towards the truth. For us Orthodox, the way we guide the person, so we do the neutral and then we guide the person through our own spiritual life. If we have God in us, that's more powerful to win them to the truth than anything. If they feel love in us, that's the main way that they're converted. So kind of tying this together is a practical thing for people who struggle with, with gender dysphoria, specifically when they deal with really being uncomfortable with their, their birth I don't care about the gender sex dichotomy. I just use the words interchangeably, but their birth gender, their birth sex, like the way God made them when they're not comfortable with that. I usually will tell them it's okay to be neutral. And this was something that was, I, I posted about this and someone took screenshots and this was misunderstood. And I reading it, I'm like, I can understand how they misunderstood this. Cause I, I said, it's okay to be androgynous. And they took the modern leftist definition, which is a mix of male and female, which is not, no, don't be a mix of male and female. Um, androgyny, the more traditional definition is not specifically male or female. So just because you're a female does not mean you have to wear makeup and try and look as effeminate as possible. If it was, it would be a sin for nuns who don't groom themselves like, and, and don't look feminine at all. Are they still women? Yes. Is there anything wrong with that? No, they're, you're not required to be feminine, even though femininity is good and beautiful, but you're not required to, and we could go on its own conversation, you know, there, but it's the symbolic. Actually, uh, there are actually, like if you go to the services, if you listen carefully, uh, services for a female saint, um, they will praise a female for being masculine in their spirit. Saint Zenia is one of those. Yeah, her her blessed manliness. I've I've heard said of her. Yeah, it's so it's, it's more than one, and I think Saint Nina the same in the service to Saint Nina. Mm. It's the same thing. Yeah, so so this and is praise, and it's a praise. They're praising a, a woman who can be, you know, anyhow. Yeah, so so what it what the what I told myself was there's there's very little commands in scripture that are gendered. The, the one we always focus, like there's there's wives speaking up in church and there's uh, women speaking in church and then there's uh, husbands love your wives, wives submit to your husbands. And people really focus in on that. And I think there's a little reason for that. But the, you go to other parts of scripture and it tells everyone to submit to each other in love. So they're very linked. Um, like even though there is a little gender difference there. But, but my point is there's very little gendered spirituality in the scriptures and the saints. There's a little bit for sure. And it's good and it's important. But most of the, the stuff is universal. Most of the stuff is thanking God, bearing your sufferings, perseverance, all these things we've talked about, they apply to everyone. So what I decided, and this was very early in my exploration of orthodoxy when I started resolving the gender dysphoria, I wasn't orthodox yet. Um, 
but I started, I was already warring with this and finding in myself this discomfort. I'm like, where is this coming from? I don't feel this is good. I never, I never had any intention to give into it. It just, I had the feeling and it made me uncomfortable. Like I always knew it wasn't from God and it wasn't something, I knew it was not my nature. So I never, never cross-dressed, never did anything like that. Never even considered transitioning. I didn't even know that was a thing. I didn't discover, I wasn't influenced by the left. Um, this was, I was kind of an outside case. But what I decided after all of this thinking I've been talking about was I'm not going to try and be a man. I'm going to try and be a godly person. But whatever comes out when I do that, I'm going to call that male. So that's how I'm going to accept that I'm male. I, and it helped me escape from a lot of these really bad stereotypes that had negatively influenced me. And then I had projected all my pain onto, like I was talking about earlier, um, that men have to, you know, be loud and do this and can't like flowers. Well, I can't help it. I like flowers. Uh, but I, and so I, I lived this way and I was just like, I'm going to be a godly person. And I noticed this trusting in God and, and this way of viewing things brought me to a peace that then I noticed there were times I wanted to do something that was a little manly and a little masculine. Mm -hmm. And I wanted, I wanted women to like, in a healthy way, see me as like a male figure. Um, and I didn't want to just be like, I, I'm the, I'm a kind of guy who's friends with a lot of girls. I like having female friends. Some people are triggered by that. Um, but I wanted to be like, a man and not just like, Oh, the like safe guy friend. Like I was that guy, unfortunately. Um, but now I'm like, no, I like being a male role model in like my social group. Um, and I like talking to men about how to be a man. Um, and I kind of had to find, like I said, from the beginning, the back door. Um, but that, I think that neutral state is very helpful. And after years, you know, this has probably been eight or nine years of exploring this subject, even though I haven't struggled with it in probably eight or nine years. What I've come to the conclusion, you know, when someone asks the question, because I heard terrible answers to this or oversimplified ones, um, how do I become a man? Like in the, in the traditional way, like we need to be men. Um, and we have to be careful about that question because if we say you can be a man by your behavior and there's behavior with being a man, we logically implicate that you could not be a man and suddenly you've actually opened the leftist door. Hmm. Um, and so we need to not link being a man to behavior unless we're very clear what we mean. And I think what we're talking about is being a man instead of a boy, not a man instead of a woman, which is how we kind of frame it, a man instead of a boy. What is the difference between a man and a boy? A boy is selfish and immature. A man is sacrificial. His mind is like Christ on other people. So a man is generally strong because most people need him to be strong. It could be strong in different ways, but in some way there's going to be a strength there and a rock like a Christ like rockness as the bride. You're the groom. So you're the rock. And so you are the foundation. If your wife is having emotions, you're strong for her. You're not affected by her. You're gentle with her, but that's part of your strength is that you can be gentle to her and, and hear her out and not be like, Oh my gosh, my wife always does this. Like that's a boy. That's selfish. A man is sacrificial like Christ. And as you're sacrificial, if you're a sacrificial person and God made you male, you will become a man. You know, and I, I would go as far as to say, you not that this is wrong, but you don't have to try and be a man. If you're a man and you're sacrificial, God has planted an unshakable seed of maleness deeper than biology in men that the, that the left doesn't understand. And even the conservatives who are just looking at biology don't understand. We Orthodox know that these are spiritual realities before they're anything else. And they manifest in the biological. And then they also sometimes manifest in the symbolic, sometimes being tanky, sometimes a woman being effeminate. Like that's, that's where the masculinity and the femininity fit in on the surface. Um, but deep down, it's the spiritual state. And if you are born male and you are sacrificial, you will become the man God made you to be. And it's also equally true if you are a woman and you focus on sacrificing, not on being a woman, let go of if you want to transition to being a man, just let go of all of it. Focus on being a person whose life is lived for God and for others, the two greatest commandments. You will become a godly woman. And the, whatever, whatever womanliness God wants to come out of you, doesn't matter what society says, conservative, liberal, doesn't matter anything. Your only care is what God says. That's what repentance is. Only what matters is if I'm doing right by God. You live like that, and I guarantee you, you will become the man or woman God has made you to be. 
Um, so I think this obligation we sometimes feel to like follow certain rules, rules are good, rules are great, but you're not obligated to like, if you're just a woman, like, oh, you have to submit to every man, like, and, and act like a wife already. Yeah, it's a little more nuanced than that. Um, but, and you have like Judge Deborah in the Old Testament being this, when the men were weak, she stood up. If the men are being weak, the woman should stand up. She shouldn't want, aspire to stand up. But as a backup plan, that's totally not a violation of womanhood. Uh, if she's like, I have to be the head. I have to be a priest. I have to be uh, a deaconess. <laughs> um, like that's, that's a little concerning. But if she's like, no men are stepping up, so I have to step up out of love, not out of self-aspiration, not out of to prove myself, that's right. And likewise, if the, if the kids need some nurturing and gentleness from the dad, if they need him to be a goofball, he's thinking about what's best for them, then he will be a goofball. He will uh, look retarded. Like there's nothing masculine about, uh, like I, I look really goofy right now doing that. Like I don't look masculine. No woman would be attracted to that. But if that's what brings my child joy, then, and I'm thinking about them, then that's what I do. That's being a man. So when we're insecure because people said some negative thing about us and we're getting really defensive, which I do, that's when I'm being a boy. That's when I'm being fragile and I'm being insecure and I'm not being a man. Um, wearing a hot pink shirt, that's, you know, that's not traditional maleness, but you can still be a man and have a hot pink shirt. But if you're going to be kind of selfish, a, you're not a man. That was kind of a, a fat or that was sort of like not the hot pink, but like a, I see a lot of light pink. You know, that was kind of a fashion thing like a couple of years ago. You know, light pink shirt with stri stripe, white stripes. That was kind of a thing that men guys were wearing. Mm. I don't know. Yeah, I guess, and, and I guess I'm really... be, uh, you know, male masculine enough to wear a light pink shirt. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm kind of like middle of the road on, I call those things like the symbolic things. Like the fact that some of us look at something and we're like, that's not very masculine and they don't like it. Like, I think that's totally fair. And then at the same time, I think that there are things that are totally fine for someone to do, even though it's also fine for some men to just be like, eh, I'm a little turned off by that. I'm not into that. So, um, yeah, I think, I think there's a both end when you're on that highest level of like the symbolic, like someone being bulky, like the, kind of the opposite of me, I'm pretty lanky, but someone being bulky like He-Man um, or Arnold Schwarzenegger, there's something symbolically masculine. Like it's a symbol that very that well expresses the masculine, you but you, you don't have to be that to be male. That's where the could, misconception is. But you could. I mean, I'm saying you could put on some some muscle. It's not that difficult. You ever you ever spent time in the gym? Like I have. I, uh, I gained. I, I put on like 50 pounds. I used to be a skinny guy. I it's I've I've I have worked out um like for seasons. Uh, it's due to some of my medical and gut issues um, that I haven't taken that up yet. I would like to, um, but yeah, yeah a lot of, definitely a lot of my good. energy goes towards that right now. So yeah, definitely yeah. a good thing that I would encourage all, all people watching. So um, I know that there are people watching this stream. They are going to, they have nothing better to do than to watch my, this stream and try to find something to clip something wrong. They're going to try to snatch something out of your mouth and, and twist it and, if you've gotten to this far in the stream and you you're just watching my stream just so you can uh, criticize something Thaddeus has said, well, you know, go go ahead, I guess. Uh, you, or but maybe you could find something better to do in your life because I've seen people do that. People just like will walk, you know, try to snatch. They don't even want to walk. Listen to what you said. They just want to find something wrong with you said. If that's going on, then you you got to go find something better to do, sir. So uh, I think we're going to wrap it up because we're coming up on the one and a half hour mark. That's usually about where I uh, where I uh, end my streams. Um, I want to give you an opportunity to tell us where we can find you. I did. Uh, I linked below your X profile and your website. But, you know, tell us where people can find you and, you know, pitch whatever you want to say for the end of the. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I'm. I'm one of those people that I just enjoy talking to anyone. So if you just have like a question or want to chit chat a little, that's totally fine. Some people always worry like, well, this is what you do for a living. Like I don't want to use, uh, feel free to like talk to me um, and, and ask me some questions or whatever. Um, if you, if you do want to like schedule a session, I always tell people 
try a session. You know, you pay me afterwards if you don't want to, if you didn't feel as good, you know, th you don't have to pay me. And then if it, if you feel like it was edifying and, um, you know, your priest likes the results or, or whatnot, or if you're just an inquirer, um, you know, we can always meet regularly or as needed. Um, but if you want to just contact me, uh, my, my website is thaddeusthought.com. Um, I've got a couple blog posts on there. The one I would recommend to, like, if you're like, I'm going to do one thing that's that, one creative project of Thaddeus is whether that's a video or anything, I would say go read The Explorer. Um, it's a short story I wrote. I consider it a therapeutic short story. It's got a, it's, you'll read it, you'll realize why I told you, why I recommended it. And at the end are some church fathers with quotes that reflect the the meaning of the story. Um, but it's about why we, why God lets us sin. Um, okay. So, but my website is ThaddeusThought.com. I have a contact me page. I have info about my coaching. Um, I have links to my I have uh, an old YouTube channel that's that's uh, Jack Falcon, Thaddeus Patrick, and then I have Thaddeus Creative. So if you want to find my YouTube channel, I have videos on there that are what I consider a book length of information in about an hour. So they're hour, they're like a full like talk or lecture, but they're just kind of like my explorations with a lot of the fathers and metaphors I came up with. Um, there's a video on doubt. Um, there's a, vi a video on spirit uh, singleness as a as a cross. Um, like if you're, if you're single, like I am, um, you know, how the Lord works through that. And so, you know, I don't have, I can't speak as much on marriage cause I don't have experience with that, but singleness, I know pretty well, uh, 33 years old. So I've got, you know, some years under the belt. Um, but yeah, so if you want to, if you're like, oh, I'd like to hear more, like in the vein of things we've talked about, I've got my orthodoxy and therapy video, like the, the bridge between those explored a lot deeper. So yeah, that's the two things, my website and my Thaddeus creative, um, YouTube channel. And the last thing I'll plug real quick here, um, I almost forgot about it. Uh, there's a there's another Orthodox coach uh, who goes by Aliyah Coaching, uh, who's on Twitter, and he's he's actually like a life coach where he's focused on disciplines and habits and stuff like that. From and he's Orthodox and he's done business coaching. I'm focused on the internal world. Um, we're actually working on a project together to start a men's uh, subscription coaching service. So with weekly webinars, guest speakers who are pr everything from a priest to maybe a nutritionist um, to people talking about working out and whatnot. Um, and it will be a lot more affordable option than, than coaching with us. Um, but it will, it will have, we both made video courses. And so God willing in the next like month or so, uh, this will be out. And our patron is Father Sarah from Rose. So we've, we're calling it R the Rose Council. So uh, follow me on Twitter social media i'm sure i'll be posting it all over once we're out but if you're if you're interested in like joining a group of orthodox men and like i i focus on the internal side uh Ilya focuses on the the external and kind of a holistic program um guided by the fathers and informed by psychology and with you know hopefully some really cool guest speakers uh yeah hopefully rose council will be coming soon so cool great Okay, well, this has been uh, Thaddeus Patrick along with uh, Young Penitent, and that's our show for the evening. Thanks, everybody, watching. We'll catch you all next time.